So, okay. Going again from right to left, this is where we find the titular alt-right. What's novel about the Sutentai ethno-nationalist is how they break from the iconography of racism. Their goal, like that of many racist people, is to attack and oppress people of color, but in such a way that the white establishment lets them get away with it. The average white person's shorthand for a racist is still primarily the Klansman and the neo-Nazi, respectively a rural working-class white nationalism and an urban working-class white nationalism. The alt-right is the gentrification of white nationalism. Their pocket squares and MBAs and $90 haircuts short out the white moderate's brain because they still associate white supremacy with white trash. The collaborator insists that they are themselves non-racist. Their decades of opposing affirmative action, right to assembly, police reform, fair voting efforts, redistricting, funding for public schools, prisoners' rights, religious tolerance, shutting down Guantanamo, accessibility for non-English speakers, immigration, investment in low-income neighborhoods, decolonizing school curricula, Indigenous Peoples' Day, putting Harriet Tubman on the 20, kneeling, ending the drug war, or withdrawing from the Middle East, are framed as problems of implementation. And probably what they don't like about our solutions is that we implied the problem was racism. Yes, 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 white people are overrepresented in dozens of industries nationwide, but have you considered that it's a fluke? Pitch me a solution for it being a fluke. The collaborator's white supremacy exists in the negative space. They agree racism exists. They agree we should oppose it. But they disagree that any individual thing you're talking about is an example of it. Getting a Republican to identify an actual incident of systemic racism is like trying to point at your shadow with a flashlight. And it's reasonable to ask, Jesus, how far can these guys push the envelope before the rest of the establishment calls them what they are? But if you're waiting for the moment a white moderate agrees mainstream conservatism has done something unacceptably and unequivocally racist, you're underestimating how long white people can equivocate. When a Democrat loses an election, what happens with the white liberal pundit class? Well, there's suddenly a lot of chatter about how to talk to your racist uncle over Thanksgiving, about how liberals in red states can contact their representatives, about the value of debate. This is our fault, they say. We let this happen. Because we didn't have enough conversations with white conservatives. You hear a lot more of that talk than about how the gutting of the Voting Rights Act cost a lot of the left the right to vote, and what could be done to guarantee their representation in the next election. In fact, you hear a lot more about how that kind of talk is alienating to the white conservatives who supported gutting the Voting Rights Act about how reaching across the aisle is going to mean easing off the race talk, at least for now. POC representation is quickly reframed as a critical long-term goal, but in the present moment, while we are competing for elected office, guaranteeing the minority vote is a luxury. See, there's this other definition of racism that most white people learn in grade school. Racism is when you say mean things to other kids about skin color and it hurts their feelings. Racism is about cruelty and harm done by white people therefore is not racism if it isn't cruel, if it's merely ignorant or apathetic. But ignorance and apathy can be reasoned with. You just gotta sit down and hash it out, as long as it takes. Real white supremacy is about emotional distress or interpersonal violence. It's uncommon, it's unpopular, and it's a hearts and minds issue. What this definition leaves out is any notion that white supremacy is about power. That white people who disavow racism still live longer, get paid better, get arrested less often, and are typically in position to negotiate with whomever's in power. That this society was built for the everyman, and being the everyman confers power upon you. When children of white moderates get older and first brush up against this definition, wherein white supremacy is not small, but all-encompassing, where it can be cruel, but is at least as often indifferent, and where every white person in the country is bound up in it and privileged by it, whether they want to be or not, 
and will never, ever experience it themselves, where it's not about feelings, but about power. Right out the gate, the white moderate is possessive not just of their whiteness, but of the very definition of racism. In the definition they know, racism exists only over here. And the white collaborator is a compatriot who shares their ultimate vision for the future and is simply gone off course somewhere. And they don't see themselves as flawed individuals with a long way still to go. They've already arrived. They're the destination everyone else needs to get to. Living proof that white supremacy can be easily and painlessly opted out of. They can't see collaborators as opponents because there is no definition of white supremacy that includes collaborators and doesn't also include them. And this is critically important. They don't want to start thinking of themselves as white. They don't want the constant awareness of one's race and how one's race is perceived. You know, the things the rest of humanity deals with. Maybe because they don't feel liberal candidates represent them. Or maybe because someone just happened to shut down all the polling locations in their neighborhood. And, you know, mathematically, there's probably a lot more disenfranchised people of color who match that description than racist white people who aren't already Republicans. But that strategy would mean doubling down on anti-racist talking points instead of easing off of them. It would mean a willingness to alienate some white people. It's giving up on them. It's admitting that a significant percentage of American whiteness is not on the side of racial equity. It means there's a definition of racism where it isn't fringe, but common and pervasive, and where addressing it requires thinking about their place in it. It means asking why they feel more affinity for white people who oppose them than people of color they claim to agree with. Why the votes of the former have to be earned, but the latter are expected. And since all that seems intolerable, they fixate on the kinds of gestures that feel like moving in the right direction, but run very little risk of arriving anywhere. How about instead of defunding the police, we give them more money than any administration in years, but also Juneteenth is a national holiday now. Something for everyone. But as a tool for achieving political ends. First and foremost, because claiming otherwise is both factually and morally wrong. But also, without this understanding, white culture can't recognize the stakes. And fascists have no use for soft power. To justify a military dictatorship, they need an opponent that won't just go away on its own one day. It always comes back to identity politics, because black people can't stop being black. Theirs is a number that will not be reduced without the hard power of violence and displacement. Fascism begins by stealing targets from the left. They focus on elites, corrupt businessmen, weak-willed politicians, subtly shifting focus away from leftist critique of systems to types of people. But sooner or later, they settle on something unchangeable. Race, gender, ethnicity, religious background. Uh, this is why the far right has gone all in on transphobia, by the way. Like, it's joined Islamophobia on the outer rim of acceptable bigotries. On some level, they know trans folks aren't just cis people in disguise, that desistance is rare and conversion therapy doesn't work, because if trans people could just stop being trans, they never would have picked them for an enemy. This is where it starts. This is why you should have no patience for anyone saying wokeness is dividing the left, we should be focusing on class. They're not attacking us on class. They're trying to sell themselves as better on class than we are. Where do you think that fairy tale about blue-collar whites comes from? They want you to believe that they, and not the socialists, are the path forward for the downtrodden. There's a reason fascism started popping up all over Europe right after the Russian Revolution. Mussolini got his start beating up socialists in the Po Valley, on the grounds that he was defending not wealthy elites, but struggling rural farmers who didn't like the socialist takeover of their industry during the Bienio Rosso. 
The fascist goal is to harness and redirect class resentment towards a scapegoat. They come at us on identity. It's also worth mentioning racism affects 58% of the working poor, so there can be no class solidarity that doesn't address it. This isn't who needs to win. This is who needs to win. And if you're white, you need to be over here. White liberals are not great at assessing the full scope of the danger. Often enough, this remains to them an argument about ideas and principles. To them, they are but words. Until someone gets hit by a car or shot, and then it's, who could have predicted? The provocateur's animating force is not hatred of people of color. It's hatred of white liberals, just as white liberals' animating force is less advocacy for people of color than moral victory over conservatives. Neither side acknowledges people of color as entities in this fight. They're viewed as tools for getting white people what they want, and their suffering is viewed as an acceptable byproduct. You've maybe heard the phrase, in the game of patriarchy, women are not the opposing team, they are the ball. Well, in the game of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, minorities are not the opposing team. They are the cars, store windows, and newspaper kiosks that get wrecked when the home team loses. Or when the home team wins. It's the Eagles fan view of oppression. And make no mistake, weaponizing or disregarding students of color is still racism. But it's racism of a kind most white people have trouble recognizing, or to speak with a sharper edge, that white people often refuse to acknowledge? So I guess the reaction to this video is, why didn't he reconcile that bit about, you know, denigrating the working class uh, racists as the only image of racism, when at the same time he's saying, oh, it's not about class at all, uh, because the right champions the I, the meme that they are the only ones helping the white working class this is you didn't you you talked about like the minors being spectators in all of this and being tokens but it's the whites who the liberals especially are the big lie is that they're a spectator in all this. They're supposed to cheerlead from the sides as the minorities stand up and demand rights and blah, blah, blah. That's the only way anything gets done and yada, yada, yada. And it's like, they are not players in this. You know, words, debate, you know, protest. It's, this is systemic racism, not some debate on some campus. Right, and it's just it's just kind of interesting um, that that lie that we're just spectators and we're cheering on the minorities. But you're part and parcel of this. You you are participants in racism. You are participants in the systemic racism in the world. Um, Finally, I think the biggest lesson of all, and uh, let me talk in particular to the white folks for a minute. Once we understand that people who look like us invented the very notion of race in order to advantage themselves and us, isn't it easier to see that it's our problem to solve? It's a white people problem. I'm embarrassed to say that for a long time I thought of racism as being mainly a struggle for people of color to fight, sort of like the people on the TV screen when I was a kid or as if I were on the sidelines at a sports contest. On one side, people of color. On the other, those real racists, the Southern sheriff, the people in hoods. And I was sincerely rooting for people of color to win the struggle. But no, there are no sidelines. We're all in it. We are implicated. And if I'm not joining the struggle to dismantle a system that advantages me, I am complicit. So yeah, that whole expected and earned thing, that was interesting. And he didn't go in deep, in, deep into it. This is just an aside, not the one thing I was looking for. 
But yeah, isn't that like flesh that out, right? Flesh this out, this concept out that you just teased our intuitions about, right? And it's interesting he should have teased this more out that uh, yes, uh, need an appointment that won't just go away on its own one day. Like, you know, the liberals think they can just talk, you know, get the moral high ground on the on the conservatives by talking to them, um, you know, and convincing them because, you know, it's just an ideology you can write. So, but the ideologists exploit the, the, the identity politics identity politics not to divide and conquer with the liberals that's a nice side product right but it's that they're picking on identity polit politics not because it's a weakness of the liberals but it's a weakness that the conservatives have at their very core because they need that in order to you know the the whole it, they can't you know they need a target that they can use forever that won't change that always going to be there so they can always have something to scare the people right uh, my own concept after watching tons of noam chomsky videos and it's not being spoken to by anybody i think is that fascism arose after the civil wars 14th Amendment empowering corporations that buys a byproduct and corporations really took off uh, pre World War One, right? And corporations in the uni United States, at least, have always had the government has always had the rule for the corporations you will do our bidding even during war, you'll make what we say, but you still have to profit. That's our rule. And <laughs> Oh no! Throw throw the corporations in the in the briar patch, and that's exactly what na the Nazis did in World War II. The Nazis, they say, oh, it's a state controlled state controlled capitalist corporation that that it, um, they they were socialist and blah 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 blah, and it was like no, it's like you're throwing money at corporations and they profit, and that was your one rule, and to me. Fascism grew out of the capitalist society because capitalism and democracy don't gel. They're not, they're antithetical. They just can't be, right? So the fascism that arises in these times of troubles is not because the poor white working class is being denigrated and they're getting taken advantage of and people are playing identity politics because it's somebody else's fault it's these thugs are merely a byproduct of the natural tendency for corrupt people to suck up and kiss kick a uh, kiss up and kick down yeah the the point is there's a theme here and it's not just capitalism it's this fascist stuff i mean fascist was from rome you know, the, the bundle of sticks they beat people with uh, that the magistrate would write back in the Roman era. And that's ancient stuff from the beginning of the Roman era. And this has been going on since before feudalism, before the Dark Ages, before the Romans, before the Greeks. And it's always been a thing. It just didn't, you know, I mean, we've had, just because it wasn't the merchants taking over, it was the kings right the, the merchants are the new kings these days um who gets voted into office politicians who do they serve the moneyed interest right so the kings have always been the same and they've always had thugs and it's interesting that he says it's not about class warfare when it totally is they're just just because they're lying about being better at class than we are and blaming the Democrats for the poor, downtrodden working class, that doesn't mean class is absolutely 100% part of it. That is the system we need to break down, right? 
that is the 100% system we need to break down. Not, oh, give rights to, you know, that's like, that's exactly what South Africa did. They allowed the blacks to partake in the limousines and the rich lifestyle where there were still millions of poor black people that are in, in the same rut they'd always been. It's just now there's, you know, there's more pigs turning into humans at the at the table of the animal farm, right? The U.S. is acting like a spectator to Israel's current Zionist racist genocide, right? I mean, if I'm going to condone anybody, I'm not going to condone Hamas. I'm going to condone the U.S. for instigating, supporting and being the master race to right to Zionism because Christian Zionism is huge I mean that's what started this whole Israel thing right so it's like what can we take from the template that this guy is trying to make and apply it to something like that and that's what I think the 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 the, the, the left lacks they are fr yes you say don't frame it in theirs but you're using their language to describe them but you're not using our language to describe what we should be doing like like teasing your uh, teasing your issue tuition out on that right i mean he had a part where he talked about you know the you know the the stakes of the attention uh, the weapons are the words and the tokens are the people of color and he says instead of players they're tokens but it's like wait this is a debate this should be a protest and of course you're implying that but it's like the stakes are violence towards people of color the weapons are physical violence but what weapons are we supposed to use it it just it just you know it's like, wait a minute, you haven't really talked about what you think. You're making all these wild claims, which is pr mostly spot on, but it's starting to look like a hot take. If you can't apply a template to this that makes sense for the rules that we should be playing by, that work. Like what stuff, what protests do work, like these student protests. I mean, the coverage has been so um, uh, defamatory at worst and uh, carefully curated at best that every time you give an interview and you try to communicate the gravity of what's happening in Gaza, um, the, the urgency of this moment, uh, the collective responsibility we feel as taxpayers in a country in the U.S. Uh, and the U.K. Um, who are extensively involved in and uh, in many ways presiding over this genocide. Yeah. This stuff gets completely written out of the narrative in favor of uh, fluffy stories about like campus tensions and free speech and whatever else. That yeah. is not the point. Those children in Gaza who are starving to death right now are the point. Well, and I have a lot of complicated feelings about the role that I'm taking on as a Jewish person in this movement because people for some reason still think that they need to defer to Jewish voices to believe that a genocide should end. And that is ridiculous. Our encampment is a safe space for all people, but especially Jewish people. We held a teach-in on anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism yesterday that I led. We're holding a Shabbat on Friday. We've been having productive conversations that I think need to be having, that should have been had had publicly for a long time about what anti-Semitism actually looks like when it's not being instrumentalized to brutalize the people of Palestine. And as a Jewish person, what I'm most worried about um, for my own safety is the way that anti-Semitism by the alt-right, by right-wing nationalists, by neo-Nazis, is not even being focused on because instead those people are being invited to Israel to support the genocide of the Palestinian people. And so if we want to have a real conversation about Jewish safety, what that means is committing to the liberation of Palestine. And so many people refuse to understand that, refuse to engage in it because of a media narrative that is being propped up by our governments in order to support their complicity in an imperial settler colonial project that Jewish people have always been opposed to. Ever so since Zionism has existed, anti-Zionists have existed. Isn't as American as apple pie? Like he was like, yeah, we're going to go into Rafa and we're going to take over. Like the way I just said that. 
and seeing that kind of shifted my perspective because I feel like a lot of people are seeing what's happening right now with Gaza as America doing Israel's bidding. But the reality is, Israel is an American colony, period. And we can draw direct parallels between the way that America expanded West and what is happening right now to Palestinians. The process of land seizure, uh, divide and conquer practices, um, incentivizing settlers to move into occupied territories. America has perfected the genocide playbook and I think it's really interesting how it kind of gets to be like, oh, we're just getting our strings pulled by Israel, blah, blah, blah. I started to think about it as Israel pretty much being our 51st state and Zionism just being a convenient vehicle. Decolonization here, this is another reason why the movements have spread so globally so quickly because everybody is seeing that Israel is simply a neo-colonial state and that is for those um, who don't even want to define um, uh, colonization as something that has ever left. I mean, really, like we are seeing it live and strong um, in Israel right now and their subjugation of the Palestinian people. They treat them like second class citizens in their own homes, on their own lands. They are subjected to different legal systems, different educational systems, simply on the basis of their race. It is textbook definition of apartheid and it is the textbook definition of colonization. It's precisely why we're seeing uh, such extreme forms of neo-McCarthyite repression and police violence right now is because uh, the political class and business class uh, and corporate media can see very clearly that the ground is shifting um, and that young people in increasingly large numbers of all races, religions, backgrounds, et cetera, um, are seeing what the global South has been saying about the United States for decade after decade after decade, uh, which is that despite its self-image as some sort of a generous benefactor to the world, it is not just an enabler of genocide in Gaza, it is an imperial menace uh, throughout huge portions of the world uh, that behaves in exploitative and brutal fashion, uh, that topples governments at will whenever they cease to do its bidding, that imposes vicious sanctions regimes on countries uh, that refuse uh, or, or resist uh, regime change efforts. Um, and so when we talk about the case of Palestine, um, uh, you know, Zionists will often accuse us of singling out Israel as if it's some singular evil in the world. And I think that what the person in the TikTok said is very important in this regard. Uh, Israel does not control the U.S. and Israel is not the only evil actor in the world. Israel is, as Nixon once put it, one of America's cops on the beat in the Middle East. Mm. Uh, it is our outpost. Um, it was formerly Britain's, now it's ours. Uh, and we are invested in it as an outpost to further our own imperial interests. Um, and large portions of the EU are, are uh, going along with this as well. Um, but in this sense, uh, there is not simply an Israeli occupation of Palestinian land and people. There is a U.S.-Israeli occupation, and that has been the case for more than half a century. There's not just Israeli apartheid, there's U.S.-Israeli apartheid. Uh, yeah. And now there's not just uh, Israeli genocide in Gaza, it's U.S.-Israeli genocide. And so in this sense, to confront uh, the reality of Gaza, um, in this moment is to confront so much about both the colonial foundations and the imperial operations of the United States. Uh, and that is the, the reckoning that I think the political class is very afraid of because it cuts much deeper than just stopping one genocide or getting one ceasefire or something like that. It cuts to the very core of decolonization here in Palestine and the dismantling of an imperial regime that has been a global nightmare for so much of the world for more than half a century. This is a British American imperial project. Oxford men wrote the Balfour Declaration. And part of what our encampment is trying to do is to really show how flimsy this decolonization rhetoric is in academic spaces. Our encampment sits on the lawn of the Pitt Rivers Museum, which is a museum of colonial atrocity. The museum has taken um, human remains off of display and still has them in storage. Decolonization is not theoretical, it is material. And that has implications for our campuses. What our encampment represents to us is a sort of reclamation, a territorial reclamation in many ways, of what this university is supposed to be for its students. And I think that what that represents on a global scale is our solidarity with these territorial decolonial movements that are happening all across the globe that have been happening all throughout history about what it actually means to decolonize. Mm. It means listening to the liberatory demands of colonized people giving those people um, the right of return to their land, these are material things. And the political class does not want to engage with that. 
because it has material implications. Yeah. And it means that the status quo will have to change. The yeah. hierarchies that we have in place will have to fall. Yeah. And that is what the Oxford Inquiry is trying to really hit home in the UK as well, because this is the imperial core. Yeah. This is where the mandate of Palestine was, Palestine was created. Yeah. And the University of Oxford encampment is not going to go anywhere until that idea is reckoned with. Well I urge you all to acknowledge the class of 2024 of Gaza. That no longer exists. Students that will not be walking their stage this year and 14,000 children who will never walk a stage ever again. Celebration without acknowledgement would be an injustice on behalf of my people. And to my fellow graduates, as many of us are future healthcare professionals, I urge you all to advocate and go against the grain when advocating for human life. I urge all schools, including UIC, to divest from companies complicit in con constructing genocide. Let us be the generation that holds morality close to our actions and holds each other accountable in times like these. With hardships we face, there will always come ease.